In this video, we're going to talk about the chi-squared Denisov test. Let's build this up with our example. Suppose we know that the market shares for four microwave oven brands in our city are as follows. So brand one has 20%, etc. cetera. But what we want to do is expand our store to a new city. So we want to know how many microwaves of each brand to stock. We assume that the market shares will be the same as in our city. Now to test this, we're going to take a sample of 400 customers in the new city to see how, which brand they would buy. So in, we took our sample 400 and we wrote down which brand they would buy. So these values here, this is our actual data for the new city. But remember, we're assuming that the market shares will be the same as our city, which means that we think that this would kind of be our theoretical distribution up here. We think those are the correct percentages. So this is kind of our theoretical distribution or maybe our proposed distri distribution. So we think those percentages would work for the new city. Here's our actual data for the new city and what we want to do is we want to compare it. So we want to know are these percentages a good match for the new city? Basically, we want to know are the percentages going to be the same in the new city. So how would we decide if the new city has the same distribution of market shares as our old city? Or in other words, how do we know if these actual counts match up with those percentages? Well, we could just compare the old and new counts, or percentages maybe, as our idea of what we would do. So if we want to know if these counts match those percentages, we could just compare them. So we do need some new notation. We'll say P1 is the true proportion of new city customers who prefer brand 1, etc. So we don't know the true proportion in the new city. Instead, that's why we took our sample data, so we can try and estimate it. But our status quo here would be that the proportions are the same as in our old city. And if that's the case, then the proportion for number 1 would be, let's see, 0.2, number 2 would be 0.35, etc. So P1 equals 0.2, P2 equals 0.35, P3 equals 0.3, P4 equals 0.15. Because the status quo would be that all of these proportions are correct. So the old proportions match the new city, or are correct for the new city. The alternative, though, is going to be what's the opposite of that? The alternative is that at least one of those proportions is wrong, because if even one of those is wrong, it throws it all off. Maybe they're all wrong, maybe two are wrong, maybe three are wrong, but at least one of those proportions is wrong. So at least one of the proposed proportions is wrong. Sometimes we phrase it like this. So our null would be that the proposed distribution fits our data. The alternative is that the proposed distribution does not fit our data. So if the proportion of customers who prefer brand 1 is 20% out of a sample of 400 customers, how many would you expect to prefer brand 1? So we'd have 0 0.2, or 20% out of 400, we just do 0 0.2 times 400 gives me 80. So this is our expected for brand 1. So what we can do is we can go down here. For each brand, we have our market share. And from our market share, we can find our theoretical expected count. So we just found for brand 1 that was 80. 
for band two, we do the same thing. We do 0.35 times our sample size of 400, which gives me 140. For our next one, we could do our 0.3 times our sample size of 400, which gives me 120. And then we could do 0.15 times our sample size of 400, which gives me 60. So these are our theoretical counts, or our expected counts of what we should have gone. Now let's compare that to our actual observed counts, our true data we got in our sample. So in our sample, we got the counts 102, 121, 120, and 57. 102, 121, 120, 57. So somehow we need to compare these expected counts to these observed counts. So like 80 and 102, those don't seem very close. But 120 and 120, those seem pretty close. So let's find a nice mathematical way to compare them. What we do is we use a Pearson chi-square test statistic. So this fancy symbol there, that little X looking thing, this is the Greek chi. And notice that has a squared, we always call it chi-square. The way we're going to do this is we're going to do the sum of all cells. We're going to do each observed count minus expected count squared over the expected. And we'll talk about what that actually looks like. And we'll have k minus 1 degrees of freedom, where k is your number of groups. In our example, we have four microwave brands, so k would be 4. Now let's think about this. If our observed counts and expected counts are really different, what kind of numbers would you be expecting? Let's see, so observed minus expected, if they're really different, I'd be getting big numbers out of that. And then I'm squaring it, so I'm getting really big numbers. So if the alternative hypothesis is true, we'd be looking for big values of chi-square. So this test will always be a right tail test, meaning that the p-value is always the area in the right tail. So let's look at our official thing here. The chi-square test for goodness of fit. We use this if we have a proposed distribution and we want to know if it's a good fit for our data. Or in other words, we want to know if our theoretical probabilities are correct. We use it if the total sample size is n and the sample items are classified into one of k groups. So in our case we had four different groups. Now the assumption is that all your expected cell counts are at least 5. The null hypothesis will always be that all your theoretical probabilities are correct, or, if you want to phrase it differently, that the proposed distribution is a good fit for our data. The alternative then is then at least one of the theoretical probabilities is incorrect, or the proposed distribution is not a good fit for our data. The expected count is always this n times pi. What we were doing is we did the sample size, oh never mind, I wrote it down below. The expected count is equal to the total sample size times the theoretical probability for that group. Your test statistic of pi squared is again we're going to sum up over all the squares each observed count minus the expected count squared over the expected count. Degrees of freedom is your number of groups minus one and the p-value is always the area under the chi-squared curve to the right of your test statistic. So using our information from our last example, let's conduct an actual hypothesis test to see if the new city has the same distribution of market shares as our old city. And remember that our sample size was 400. Let's see a few things. We have four brands, so this tells me that we have four groups. So k equals 4. These are our theoretical probabilities. These are my expected counts. These are my observed counts. Okay, let's just choose alpha equals 0.05. Our assumption that we need to check is that all expected values are at least 5. So check your expected values, 80, 140, 120, 60. Those are all pretty big, so we're good there. For the null and alternative hypotheses, we've already written these down before, but let's do it again. 
This would be the theoretical probabilities are correct. So these theoretical probabilities of 20%, 35%, etc. The alternative then is that at least one of the theoretical probabilities is incorrect. Your test statistic is this chi-squared equals the sum of we're going to do each observed minus expected squared divided by the expected. What this looks like is we come up to our table and we take the first observed value and minus its expected value. So 102 minus 80 squared and then divide by the expected. Biggest mistake I see people make is they divide by the observed instead of the expected. Plus, and now you go to your next one and say, this observed is 121 and its expected is 140. So 121 minus 140 squared over 140. My next one is going to be 120 minus 120 squared over 120. And finally, 57 and 60. So 57 minus 60 squared over 60. You can put this in your calculator and find that you get 8.78. So our degrees of freedom is k minus 1, or in other words, your number of groups minus 1. So in our case, we have four groups, so three degrees of freedom. And for our p-value, the chi-square distribution, if you remember, we did talk about it once, it is very right skewed. Here's my 8.78, and I want the area to the right. When you pull off your chi-square table, notice there are two different tables. One is for areas to the left, and the next one is for areas to the right. It's very important that for this test you use the areas to the right. There is another test that uses areas to the left, and that's why it's in there, but we're not using that here. Okay. And in fact, we're not actually going to use it at all this semester. So you could just throw that one out. So we are looking when we have three degrees of freedom, and we have a test statistic of 8.78, which would be about here. What's your probability? So it looks like we're between 0.025 and 0.05. So this p-value is between 0.025 and 0.05. Now looking at that, that would be a small p-value. Which means that I would reject my null. And because I rejected my null, that means I could say I have something like evidence that the data or that the probabilities don't fit our data. Okay, so that's kind of my shorthand. Now let's put in a more official version. So in general, we say it's evidence that our probabilities don't fit our data. Now going back to what we were talking about in this problem, remember we had our market shares, theoretical probabilities, they're kind of like our old city, and we want to see if they fit our new city. So what we can say is at least one of these probabilities is incorrect. So we have probability that at least one of the probabilities is wrong, or evidence that at least one of the market shares is different. Okay, notice it doesn't actually tell us which probability is wrong or which market share is different or how many are different, just that at least one of those theoretical probabilities is wrong. So at least one of the market shares would be different in this new city. In our next example, we think that the gender of a child follows a binomial distribution. We're interested in families with four children, and we think the boys and girls are equally likely. Now, if all of those hold, then the binomial distribution would be a pretty good way to describe it. Specifically, it would be a binomial distribution.
If you have four children, then n equals four, and if boys and girls are equally likely, then p would be 0.5. Now, you probably don't remember the exact formula, but the formula to find probabilities for a binomial distribution is n choose x times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x. So that's how you find probabilities. Now in this case, we took a sample of three inch of families, and you can see our actual observed counts. So 18 families had zero boys, 78 families have one boy, 108 families had two boys. Let's conduct a hypothesis test to see if the gender of the child in the four families four children families follows the binomial distribution with the probability of a boy equal to 0.5. Some of the things I might notice when I look at this is there are five different groups. So k equals 5 for five groups. Okay. You can see that we have the observed counts, but I need to write down my theoretical probabilities. So I actually have to calculate each of these. So for zero boys, we have to use this formula. So there are four children to zero boys, a probability of 0.5 raised to the power of zero, times one minus 0.5 to the power of four minus zero, which equals 0 0.0625. We're going to do this for each one, so four choose one, 0.5 choose one to the power of one, and one minus 0.5 to the four minus one which is 0.25. And I can continue this pattern and get 0 0.375, 0 0.25, and 0 0.0625. So these are our theoretical probabilities. So with these, let's find our expected count. So expected count is always your sample size times the theoretical probability. So I get 18.75. My next one would be 300 times 0 0.25, which gives me 75, etc. So we keep going. I get 112.5, 75, and 18.75. So these are all of our expected counts. You can see 18, 18, 78, 75, 108, 112. Looks like we're fairly close. Let's go ahead and do a hypothesis test and see how close. Let's choose alpha equals 0.05. We also need to check our assumptions which is that all the expected values are at least 5. And it looks like they are. For our hypotheses, the null hypothesis is always that our distribution fits our data or the theoretical probabilities fit our data. In our case, we were talking about the binomial distribution. So we say something like the binomial distribution with n equals 4 and p equals 0.5 is a good fit for our data. The alternative then would just be that that binomial distribution with n equals 4 and p equals 0.5 is not a good fit for our data. Our test statistic is what makes this a little more labor intensive. So our chi squared is equal to the sum of each observed minus expected squared over the expected. So what that means is we're going to come up here for every single column or row or cell and do each observed count minus the expected square and then you have our expected. Okay so our first observed is 18. And it's expected is 18.75. We need a square, and then make sure you divide by the expected of 18.75. Plus our next one is 78 minus its expected of 75 uh. squared divided by the expected. Plus our next one is 108 minus 112.5. We're going to square it and divide by 112.5. And keep going. <laughs> when we have 70 minus its expected 75 squared over 75 and 26 minus 18.75 squared over 18.75. So again, make sure you divide by the expected counts. Make sure you put it all in your calculator very carefully and you get 3.46.
We also need degrees of freedom, which is equal to k minus 1. We had five groups, because so we have to count the zero, so five groups means we have four degrees of freedom. For our p-value, we'll draw our chi-squared distribution. Our test statistic is 3.46, and we're always looking for the area to the right. So let's go to our chi-squared table with four degrees of freedom now, and we're looking for 3.47, which would be somewhere about here. So bigger than 0.25, so our p-value is bigger than 0.25. The exact value, if you use a computer, is 0.483. So that's a pretty big p-value. That's certainly bigger than alpha equals 0.5. So this is a big p-value. So we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis. Then we'll write a conclusion that goes something like this. Remember, our conclusion is always in terms of the alternative, and the alternative was that the distribution is not a good fit for our data. But we failed to reject it, and that means we don't have evidence for the alternative. So we'd say we didn't find enough evidence to conclude that the binomial distribution with n equals 4 and p equals 0.5 is not a good fit for our data. So let's reemphasize this here. We did not find enough evidence to conclude that the binomial distribution is not a good fit for our data. Which might seem like a double negative, and it kind of is, but there's an important distinction here. We haven't actually shown that the binomial distribution is a good fit for our data. Because on the process test, you're always looking for evidence for the alternative. So we just didn't actually find enough evidence to say that it's not a good fit for our data. So what does this really mean? means we didn't actually find evidence for the null that the distribution fits our data. We were trying to look for evidence against it, but we didn't find evidence against the null, which is what we were actually looking for. So practically speaking, this would mean that until something else happens, like different data comes, or scientific breakthroughs or something, we can probably safely use the binomial distribution with n equals 4 and p equals 0.5 to describe our data.